In my hand, I could hold the next cure for cancer or the potential for a treatment to drug-resistant bacteria. I'm a scorpion biologist, and I'd like to argue that those things are absolutely possible. But for those of you sitting in the audience right now wondering what does it mean to be a scorpion biologist, you're certainly not alone. In fact, I ask myself that question on, on bad days. So I brought along a little clip to give you a sense of what a day in the life of a scorpion biologist looks like. You want me to tell you if we're about to, about to smack your head on something? Do you want to dump some of that stuff out? But you can give me the sack and I'll carry it. I try to do a full sack every day. Not over there? Yeah. Like critical. It is. So while much of my time is spent traveling the four corners of the earth, in, in the words of E.O. Wilson, putting boots on the ground, looking for scorpions, really engaged in this discovery and exploration, scorpions are the real stars of the show here. So I'd like to share with you all a little bit about what really turned me on to scorpions. <coughs> this is a scorpion. For those of you cringing, don't worry, it's not gonna jump off the screen. This is an Arizona bark scorpion, and it's the most dangerous species we have here in the United States. Although, luckily for all of us, there's a commercial antivenin available to treat the few dangerous cases that are seen every year. But scorpions are really enigmatic creatures. They've been on Earth for over 450 million years, and in that time have essentially remained unchanged in their basic architecture. They still use chewing mouthparts to externally digest their prey. They still breathe through gills, which are now internalized and passively diffuse air. And they still give birth to live young. In fact, they're the only arthropods that do so. And it's perhaps this feature that's really allowed them to maintain their life on this earth for so long relatively unchanged. Scorpions today are rarely longer than the length of your hand, but if we think back to their earliest days, the ancestors of scorpions were up to two meters in length. And these marine creatures were the first multicellular predators to invade terrestrial lands. Some of the earliest evidence we have for how this happened is ancient trackways along riverbeds, indicating that scorpions were coming out on the land, and it's thought that they were probably eating fish that were spawning upstream the Carboniferous version of grizzlies eating the ancestor of our modern-day salmon. But scorpions are much more interesting than that. I think that in this age, with our access to technology, we often have this illusion that we know everything that there is to know about life on Earth. But just a hundred years ago, we knew an order of magnitude less about scorpions. In fact, we only had discovered 283 species, whereas today we've increased that number by an entire order of magnitude. And as of yesterday, there were 2,405 species known to science. And there's dozens of new species being added to this count every year. One of the reasons for this has been the discovery of a new technology, ultraviolet light, often referred to as a black light, it causes a fluorescence in scorpions that makes them extremely easy to spot. So now, scientists can go out into the field at night with a portable ultraviolet light like this one and spot scorpions from up to two meters away while they're out and active because they're nocturnal creatures. I think often when people think about scorpions, they think of something like this. Dusty, desert, dry, but this advent of ultraviolet technology has really allowed us to find scorpions in habitats which are more difficult to find them in, 
oftentimes people would never think of a scorpion being here. This is a boulder on top of a creek in a tropical rainforest. And scorpions can be found from the highest mountain peaks on Earth. They're found in the Alps and the Andes, all the way down to deep caves a thousand meters below sea level. They're in cloud forests like this one on an island off the coast of Africa. They're in the intertidal zone of beaches, the space between high and low tide where they live in seaweed bed bunches. They're in deep mud caves like this one in the Choco rainforest of Colombia. But to give you a sense of what that discovery feels like, I brought along a little clip. Last year, I was fortunate enough to be a part of a 40 scientist multinational team conducting the first survey of, from canopy to forest floor of a tropical rainforest in Penang, Malaysia. And because we were such a big group, we had the fortune of bringing along some press with us who created this little clip that I'd like to show you. I think one of the most common reactions that I get when I tell people that I've discovered new species is utter surprise that there are new species left to be discovered. That's the male of the new species. That's the first male we got. No way. Yeah. What we're doing is looking under every rock, every log, every debris on the ground. So you really have to like put yourself into the shoes of an arachnid and imagine if I was an arachnid, where would I be hiding? That's the jumping spider. As soon as you get back to the base camp and start looking at what you've collected, you may notice that you've collected all the same few species, which is a sign of a disturbed forest, or you've collected a lot of different species, which is a sign of a healthy forest. So in this case, we found a scorpion within 30 minutes on our first day on the trails. And it was a new species that had never been recorded in science. And all of this in spite of the fact that the forest we were surveying was literally a stone's throw away of a city of four million people. So it just goes to show how much is still out there to be discovered. But our work does not end there. Discovering and making new records is just the first step. Once we've found a specimen, we bring it back to a research collection. I work at the California Academy of Sciences, just down the road in Golden Gate Park, and in our research collections, we hold over 14 million specimens of insects and arachnids. And each specimen is a record of a time and place on Earth. It's a miniature time machine, giving us some insight into what Earth looked and felt like and what was living there at that moment in time. And this kind of biodiversity research is very important. From an evolutionary perspective, until we understand what things are here that we're sharing the Earth with and what they're doing, it's nearly impossible for us to ensure that the evolutionary processes that happened in the past leading to today's biodiversity can be continued into the future, allowing for the next generation of biodiversity on Earth. Oftentimes, scientists are placed in a race. Because human development is altering the natural environment at an extremely rapid pace, scientists are in a race to discover and describe the biodiversity on Earth before it goes extinct. Unfortunately, this is not a race that we're winning. But I would argue that that's something we can change with the right societal motivation. There are only 25 of those 2,400 species of scorpions on Earth that can deliver a lethal sting to humans. And though they're responsible for several thousand deaths a year, that tends to be the main aspect of scorpion venom that we're focused on. But scorpion venom is a complex cocktail. An individual scorpion can have up to 200 unique components in their venom. And each of those components acts with a very high degree of specificity. For example, there's neurotoxins that target the way that our nerve cells transmit signals, either blocking those transmissions, keeping our, preventing our nerve cells from speaking to one another, or activating those transmissions, telling our bodies that they're experiencing extreme pain when in fact there's nothing happening to it. And it's those kinds of peptides, of bioactive compounds, that we should be focusing on. 
And this number here, eight million, that's the current value of a single liter of scorpion venom in research. It's big business, and one that's not being utilized very much. So far, we've been able to do document and describe about 1,000 bioactive compounds from scorpions all over the world. However, we estimate that there's 100,000 bioactive compounds present in the scorpions living on Earth right now. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why this is so important. Drugs. Bioactive compounds, because of their specificity, are really great models for new drugs. And I'd like to show you just a couple of examples. So far, there have been no drugs derived from bioactive compounds of animals that have made it to the market. But there's a few that are in the pipeline. And of those 1,000 compounds that we've discovered and described so far, these are just three examples. The first is a potential treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. This is a peptide that was discovered in the scorpion pictured here. This is Mesobuthus martensi. And in this case, it's a peptide that inhibits the transmission of, of signals from one nerve to another. And pictured here are the feet from some mice that have been experimentally given rheumatoid arthritis. And when we apply this peptide to these mice, the decrease in symptoms from the rheumatoid arthritis is decreased by an order of magnitude that's significantly different from those mice receiving either a placebo or no treatment whatsoever. So this is really promising. The next example is in the treatment of MRSA. You may have heard of MRSA because it's often in the news. It's methylcan-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And basically what that is is a really bad bug. It's a bug that is really common in hospitals and is re resistant to our current antibiotics. And so we're really on the hunt for new ways to, to combat this bacteria. It's particularly bad in individuals that have a compromised immune system. This is a peptide that is an antimicrobial. That's just one of the many things in the cocktail of this scorpion. And it was applied topically to mice that had been experimentally given a MRSA infection on their skin. And after only four days, the experimental group, which received scorpion venom as a treatment, had their MRSA infection completely cured. Whereas those that had either placebo or no treatment at all had either worsened infections or no change in their infection. The last example I'd like to talk to you about is one that's made it the furthest down the pipeline. This has actually been approved for clinical trials in humans, and that's really promising. This beautiful scorpion sitting on the screen is the Israeli death stalker scorpion. <laughs> Certainly nothing that you'd want to encounter in your day-to-day -day life. In fact, a sting from this scorpion is lethal to adult humans. But it was realized, accidentally, that the venom of this scorpion has a really odd, oddly acting component. This neurotoxin targets brain glioma cells in mice. And if you don't know what a brain glioma is, it's a type of cancer that is in your brain. And when it comes to brain cancer, there's no good solutions. Currently, our best solution is to remove the tumor. And the way that's done is a surgeon goes in, excises the tumor by, with, with surgery, they remove it with a scalpel, and they have to cut away the tumor until they realize that the tumor has clean margins. And what that means is that there's no cancerous cells in the margin of what they've removed from your brain. And when it comes to brain removal, there's nothing about that that's going to be advantageous for the recipient of the surgery. But because this peptide is targeting brain glioma cells, what some researchers have discovered is that they can remove all of the bad parts of that peptide, leaving just the targeting section intact, and attach instead a fluorescent dye. And this fluorescent dye, when injected into a patient, attaches itself to brain glioma cells with the help of scorpion venom. And then a surgeon can go in with microsurgical equipment and excise 
only the cells that are infected with cancer because they're glowing with fluorescent dye and leave all of the healthy brain cells entirely intact. And so this represents a really big leap forward in how we can treat this type of cancer. Again, this is a single peptide from one of the only 1,000 bioactive compounds that we've identified so far. So there's a lot of potential treatments out there for quite a number of, of, of ailments. Each step forward that we make in our discovery and documentation of life on Earth represents a step forward for humankind. I, can't I don't know if you'll remember, but at the beginning of this talk, I told you that it was possible for me to hold in my hand the cure for cancer and a treatment for drug-resistant bacteria. And in fact, I am holding that in my hand. I brought with me here this scorpion. It's one that I collected during my expedition to Penang last year. And it represents a new record, a new record for Penang. And it's now one of those entries into our library of life on Earth in our natural history collections. But this new record doesn't only represent a discovery for science, it also represents a step forward in our treatment with bioactive compounds. This little scorpion, which is completely harmless to me, could hold the next cure for cancer. And just to give you a sense of what it looked like when I found it, I brought along an ultraviolet light. And you can see that this otherwise entirely brown little scorpion fluoresces an extremely bright green with the UV light. I'd like to think that moving forward with scientific discovery is important. As a scorpion biologist and an evolutionary biologist, I consider every discovery a win. But even more importantly, I'd like to think that this step is a step in advancing humanity. I'd like to think that with the right motivation, we will become Earth stewards, if not in our, for, to, for our own interests. Thank you very much.